So, um, okay, I, other than to say that I was aiming for the longest title in this workshop, I'll <laughs> just go on to the, to the topic itself. And uh, as you know, uh, um, there, there's been, a, um, we, we know that, uh, that uh, recent human demography had a substantial impact on patterns of genetic variation, specifically uh, recently uh, Recent uh, deep sequencing studies revealed a huge amount of rare variants, uh, likely the result of re recent explosive growth over the past uh, 5,000 years or so. And, uh, and uh, older studies and newer studies as well have revealed uh, a substantial excess of, uh, of common variants in uh, Europeans and Asians uh, compared to Africans, likely the result of a bottleneck or a series of bottlenecks uh, at the out of Africa split, and um, these uh, dramatic effects on uh, on uh, genetic diversity uh, naturally lead to many questions. A couple of these questions is whether uh, this change in 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 uh, the attributes of genetic variation uh, affected the burden of genetic disease or the genetic uh, load in human populations, and perhaps it should be different to different human populations. And the second question is um, how that may have affected the architecture of, a, of complex disease or other, other uh, quantitative traits. And specifically, you could think if, uh, for example, due to growth, um, a lot of the uh, risk of complex disease comes from a rare, rare variants that could help explain uh, the missing heritability uh, that we see in many GUAs, as well as uh, suggest some uh, that, that we will require strategies based on deep sequencing in order to map a lot of the uh, underpinnings of, uh, of uh, these uh, genetic diseases. And for these reasons and others, there's been a, a lots of speculation about the, this topic uh, recently. Um, there's been claims that maybe the genetic load should be uh, higher in non-Africans compared to Africans or vice versa, and maybe due to recent growth, there should be a major, some, some uh, contribution of, uh, added contribution of rare variants to, to uh, disease risk. Um, so I'll begin by giving away the punchline of my talk, which is uh, what we uh, found, that, uh, that at least our, our work suggests that uh, the effects of these demographic events on uh, uh, genetic load uh, were probably quite minor, uh, if at all. And that the architecture, the effects on architecture strongly depend on how strongly a trait or a disease is coupled with, a, with fitness. So having given away the punchline, I'll tell you a little bit about how we reach these conclusions. Um, so what, what we do in order to study these questions, we use a very, the, the, the standard uh, biallelic viali uh, viability selection model with two-way mutation. Um, well, I'll assume, for just for simplicity, that uh, the mutation rate is uh, equal in both directions. Uh, we focus on the semi-dominant and recessive cases, even though we show that our qualitative results are similar across the range of dominance coefficients. And we assume a linkage equilibrium and multiplicative uh, uh, fitness uh, across sites to make things as simple as possible. And then we look at three demographic scenarios. One is a complex demographic scenario uh, recently inferred by uh, Tennyson in co-authors for uh, African Americans, including uh, recent uh, explosive growth, and for uh, uh, European Americans, including the out of Africa split, two bottlenecks, and recent growth, as well as migration between these two populations. And the main features, the important thing is the main features of these uh, of this model are similar to other uh, recent models uh, where the estimates here are, were based on uh, more data. Um, now, in, in order to get a better understanding of the main demographic effects, then we also use two simpler models. One is a, a bottleneck model using uh, European uh, parameters, and another is a growth, exponential growth model using uh, the African parameters from this model. Um, so, so first I'll begin with genetic load, and I'll, you know, as I'll, I'll remind you that genetic load is defined as the relative reduction in uh, fitness due to the deleterious uh, alleles. 
and specifically we focus on the genetic load uh, uh, at a given site, uh, the expected genetic load at a given site, which means that uh, given uh, the parameters for this site, the dominance coefficient and the selection coefficients, we could simulate or, uh, or run the uh, many independent sites through the uh, demographic scenario and you get the distribution of deleterious allele frequencies and then we want to know what's the expected uh, load at the site given this uh, distribution and specifically this expectation would simply be the reduction in fitness due to uh, uh, due to uh, heterozygote times the expected number of heterozygotes uh, plus the a reduction in the deleterious homozygote times the expected uh, frequency of uh, deleterious homozygotes. And um, we, we, we focus on the single site and we note that uh, at least with the multiplicative fitness scheme then, then the load at many independent sites would be a simple function of this, uh, of this load. Um, now just as a Another reminder, when we have a constant population size, then genetic load exhibits three dynamic regimes. Uh, one is the strong regime, where uh, essentially all the deleterious uh, alleles are segregating at very low frequencies, and for the semi-dominant case, we, from the classic mutation selection balance uh, calculations, we get that the load would be two times the mutation rate, and uh, for the recessive case, it would be one times the mutation rate. And then there's the uh, effectively neutral regime, where by effectively neutral I mean that selection is not doing anything to allele frequencies. And most of the load in that case would come from uh, sites fixed for the deleterious alleles. And because lo those don't change, as we increase the selection coefficient, then the load just increases linearly. Um, and then you have the region in uh, between, the weakly selected region, and then the beginning it increases linearly just because of the increase in the selection coefficient and then starts decreasing because of the decrease in the frequency of deleterious alleles. So we have these three dynamic regimes. Um, so now I'll give you a sense of how our results look like, how our simulation results look like. Um, so I'll first focus on the sim simple case of growth and uh, because we're interested in changes of loads due to a uh, recent demography, what we could do is we could look at the difference in load in, in our demographic scenario and subtract the load in a constant population size and specifically the constant population size before the onset of the non-equilibrium demographic scenario we're considering. Um, and we look at the, that across a range of uh, selection coefficients. I see you can't see this very well, but this goes from very weak 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 1. So we, we span the range. The, the important line here is the blue one, which is the total difference in load for the semi-dominant and recessive cases. And if you look at the y-axis, you see that there's a, effectively a very small effect in this case, practically negligible effect. Uh, however, we could also break the load up to the contribution from segregating and fixed sites. And then you see that actually in terms of the dynamics, we have the same three parameter regimes we had before where um, this is the uh, effectively neutral, weakly selected, and uh, strongly selected regime. And now if we look at uh, the other demographic scenarios I told you that we looked at, um, the, the tennis and complex model, the bottleneck model, then we see that the, the important thing here is that in all cases, um, the, the total difference in load that we see is very, very small, even in the case where it's the largest, which corresponds to the bottleneck recessive scenario, then uh, the blue line is still very small. If you look at the x-axis, in this case, we actually have a fourth dynamic regime. But, um, but this is the bottom line. But of course, you know, in order to uh, better understand uh, why this is the case, then what you need to do, or at least what we needed to do, is to break this up into uh, the different cases and the different dynamic regimes because the explanation for what's going on here is different, different uh, selection regimes and dominance coefficients. So just to show you that this is a, in the paper, or more accurately in the supplement, we go through all these cases and we use extensive simulations and analytic tools in order to understand what's going on in each of these regimes. And, and today I'm just going to try to give you a taste of, a, of two of these regimes. The first one um, is the strong selection dominant case, what happened 
what happens there. And so what, what, what I'll assume in this case is, uh, by, by dominant I mean that uh, the dominance coefficient is sufficiently large such that selection uh, acts uh, only on heterozygotes, okay? And um, so, so this would be true for any dominance coefficient which is sufficiently large. Um, and in this case, to, to give you the simple intuition, let's look at the case, a case of constant and changing population size. So um, if we, uh, so in this case I marked uh, by black just the total number of alleles. And in red I marked the uh, expected number of uh, deleterious mutations that uh, arose uh, due to mutations that arose tau generations in the past. Um, and what we see is that in a single generation, the expected number of uh, deleterious alleles just, is just reduced by uh, 1 minus HS due to selection on heterozygotes. Now if we move to the uh, case where to a changing population size case, so specifically here, for example, I assume the population grows by a factor of 1 plus A every generation, uh, so you see that the total number of alleles grows, then, then, and now you could look at the expected change in the number of deleterious alleles in a, in a single generation, then the expected change here is going to be a 1 minus HS due to selection on heterozygotes time 1 plus A due to the increase in population size. However, if you look at the allele frequency, then the change due to the increase in population size is precisely balanced by the change in the total number of alleles. And you, you know, you could write it down formally and you could show that for, um, for something that's uh, sufficiently strongly selected and sufficiently dominant, this would be true for an arbitrary change in population size. You expect no, no difference in, uh, in load. Um, so, so you just recover the classic mutation selection. You need to go through the branching process, but you just recover the classic mutation selection balance uh, results for the deleterious allele frequency and for the expected load. Um, to give you a little bit uh, more intuition about what's going on, it, it, it's useful to think about you know, uh, allelic trajectories. So let's consider uh, two populations, one larger than the other, and here I'm showing you just a mutation that arises and goes through the population in this cartoon until it goes extinct. So these are the numbers. Um, now, because, uh, the, uh, selection on, uh, because the selection on heterozygotes is sufficiently strong, then we could assume that the deleterious alleles uh, never reach substantial population frequencies at, uh, at any point, uh, which means that we could uh, approximate this very well by a branching process. Another an implication of this is that if you just look at the trajectories of a single mutation in numbers, they should look you know, the same, statistically speaking, in a smaller and larger population. The, the numbers just follow the same process. Okay? What will happen in a larger population, in this case the blue one, is you would just have you know, more mutations arise. Okay? But however, again, if we look at the uh, frequency of deleterious alleles, then because this red guy is in a smaller population, its uh, frequency would be larger. So what happens is that, that the uh, input of uh, deleterious alleles is balanced by the increase in the population size. And from this you also see that actually the uh, properties of genetic variation will change while the load will remain the same. Because you see that you're going to have the larger population, you'll have more segregating sites, but they're going to be segregating at a lower frequency. Okay, and, and, and this would also be true um, for changing population size, this, uh, this uh, basic insight. The, the last thing I'm going to tell you about this, uh, this case of, of uh, strong selection and uh, at least partial dominance is, um, is that while the load remains the same the, and, and the properties of variation change, um, they change very quickly in this case. So, so here you see uh, the bottleneck in, in the growth scenarios and we're looking at various statistics of, uh, of segregating sites um, uh, at numbers per a million strongly selected sites, in this case with a selection coefficient of 1%. Uh, 
Um, and you see that the load, which is in, in this case just the number proportional to the number of deleterious alleles per individual, remains the same in all these cases. But if you look at other uh, statistics, such as the number of segregating sites or the fraction of segregating sites that are rare, in this case below 0.1%, uh, then these change very quickly after the bottleneck or after the onset of growth. And the reason they change very quickly is because of the turnover of a strongly selected allele through a population is very quick. So the trajectories behave like one over the selection coefficient, and therefore very quickly you equilibrate to the uh, uh, properties of the new population size. Um, the next case I'll show you, which is less interesting, but still I think we're worth looking at is, is, a, is the case of growth with a weak selection. Um, and in this case, what we saw from, from the simulations is, is the load, again, is if it, has, it has a very little effect on load, but you do see in the weakly selected regime that the contribution from fixed sites goes down and is precisely compensated by the contribution from segregating sites. Um, so what's going on here? So if we consider, so, so the feature of uh, the weak selection regime is that, you, uh, is that many sites are fixed for the deleterious allele. And when, when you change the uh, population size, at least at equilibrium, then if we look at the proportion of sites fixed for the deleterious allele as, as a function of the scale selection coefficient, 2NS, then it obviously goes down very quickly in the weakly selected regime. So you would expect that if you change the population size, you're going to move from having more fixed for the deleterious allele uh, to less fixed for the deleterious allele. And of course, you'd be right. The only problem is that this process happens extremely slowly because it's mutation limited. So here you see um, the this same fraction of sites as a function of time in, in a in uh, units of million generations for the bottleneck and growth in scenario. So it just takes a very, very long time because you're waiting for the mutations to come in to survive the initial period and then fix, and you have a long way to go. Um, and then you could wonder, okay, so this is the, so, so we don't see almost any change in, in uh, fixed, and you could say, okay, maybe we'll get a change from what's segregating in the population. Um, so here you see the, the results of, so, uh, of uh, simulations for the uh, constant population size and growth case. You see the uh, frequency spectrum of uh, deleterious alleles. And focus, so here the, you can't see the gray very well, but, but this is a logarithmic region in the, uh, the size that I'll talk about in a moment. But in, any, in intermediate frequencies, or most of the frequencies, you see no change at all. And the reason, again, is because uh, um, weakly selected uh, segregating sites take a very long time to change their distribution. And, and the growth in humans was, was very, very recent compared to that time scale. So, so practically, you have no, uh, no uh, notable difference. The one difference you do see is if you focus very closely to the, to the boundaries um, of this frequency range, you see that you have a, a, a large increase in the growth case in the number of uh, sites segregating with very, very low frequencies. And the reason is, you know, you increase the population size, you immediately increase the mutational input. So mutations enter, but they don't have time to go anywhere. And that's why, um, uh, and okay, so this is just contrary to the strongly selected case. Weakly selected uh, sites take a very long time to respond to demographic changes, and and this effect at the boundaries is exactly what explains this shift from fixed load to segregating load. Um, so, um, so we go through these cases and we see that there should be. It seems that there, there should be very little effect on uh, genetic load, and luckily we could uh, we could uh, check a, str a strongly related prediction. So we could take two human populations with very dramatic differences in their uh, demographic history, like a, a, an African and a European populations, and a, 
according to our predictions, individuals in these populations should on average carry the same number of deleterious alleles, and that should be true if we look at different classes of sites. Um, um, so we, we do that, and we do that using deep sequencing data from, uh, from uh, African Americans and uh, European Americans, and also using the Central European and Yoruba uh, data from the Thousand Genomes Project. And, and then in order to classify, so this is exon data, so in order to uh, classify the amino acid variants that we have in our data set, we could use a, a to, one of the tools that exists to, uh, to uh, classify variants according to their degree of severity, like polyphen 2. We use polyphen 2. We used other uh, methods of uh, classification. And then once you have this data, what you could do is you could take a, you know, equal size samples from both of the populations. And, uh, and then within each class, you look at all the variants that segregate in the joint sample. So obviously what doesn't segregate in the joint sample won't, would be the same in the two populations, the important, but, but it's important to look um, at, uh, at the joint sample. And then what you could do is at all these segregating sites, you could look at the average, the average derived allele frequencies in each of these classes, in each of these populations. So that's equivalent up to multiplicative factor to the average number carried by, by uh, each uh, individual. So we do that, and there's some uh, nasty biases that we had to go over, which I won't go into, but uh, I'd but, uh, be glad to tell you about when we get to the questions. And this is what we see. So. Here, what you see is the, the mean derived allele uh, frequency uh, in different classes of sites, including non-coding, synonymous, benign, non-synonymous, possibly damaging, and probably damaging non-synonymous uh, variants, where if you want the numbers, they're, they're down here. Now, the, the red corresponds to the African Americans and the blue to the European Americans, and the widgets correspond to two standard deviations around the mean. Um, and, and you look at this and say you take the synonymous as a proxy for neutrality, so that is reassuring to see that they're the same because this just tells you that, you know, effects uh, relating to differences in mutation rate per, per the time of the lineage, like Molly discussed today, are not, are not a big factor uh, tomorrow, uh, yesterday. I mean, um, um, so this is a useful control, and you also see that as you go to a more severe class according to the classification, then indeed the frequencies go down. So the classification is definitely doing what it's supposed to do. Um, but uh, more interestingly, in our context, there's practically no difference between these estimates. Okay, none of them is even remotely significant, and. Um, that, that remains the case uh, if you look at different classification me methods. And uh, I'll just note that huge amounts of data went into these estimates. So it's not the result of having very little data. Of course, having more would be good. Yeah. So the frequency spectrum for the two populations is different. But yeah. So what are you actually plotting here? The mean derived allele frequency? The mean derived allele frequency. You could also think about it as a, you know, up to. This includes fixed sites? Is that the idea? What? Does this include fixed sites? It doesn't, right? Well, if sites are fixed uh, for one allele in one population and another allele in the other population, they, they would be segregating in the joint sample, and therefore they would be counted here. I see. Um, so, um, okay, so you so you could do this. Uh, we we well, see that zeros is the question. And so, in one population, for like the European Americans, if there's more mutations in the African population then you're including all those as zeros. In the yeah, equation. absolutely. Because if, you, if you're interested in the uh, average number of derived alleles carried in the two populations, if you wouldn't count that, then, then that would be pretty bad, right? Because you could have a deleterious allele in one and not in the other, and you wouldn't count it. So you want to count that when you're considering the average number of deleterious alleles carried by an individual. So, um, so none of the, uh, yeah. Are also the same because all your results are about deleterious mutations, right? right? Yeah, so so if you're thinking about the um, let's see, is there a marker here? So, so if you're thinking about a, about a neutral site and we're looking at the number of derived allele per individual 
and assuming that generation time and mutation is all the same, then you could think about it as a single sample from one generation and a single sample from the other generation. And, uh, and you're asking how many derived alleles you're going to see here and here, and assuming all the standard assumptions, given that this lineage, these lineages are the same length, you expect the same, the same number. OK, so that's why you expect the, the neutral case to be the same. So it's actually reassuring. It's kind of a control for things like differences in mutation rates affecting us and differences in generation time and so on. So, um, OK, so uh, yeah, so we do this using different data sets, different methods of classification, and so on. We, we get the, essentially the same results. Um, OK, so so far we've seen that at least uh, according to our theory and simulations, it should be the same. And as far as the data analysis says, it is the same, um, as far as we could tell, given our data. But the fact that uh, the load doesn't change doesn't mean that the genetic architecture of, uh, of disease risk or other quantitative traits doesn't change. Because we do, we do see the, the, the properties of genetic diversity of, of, gen of polymorphisms changing a lot, specifically under growth the load remained the same because we had an increase in the number of segregating sites counterbalanced by a reduction in frequency. And in the case of bottlenecks, we had the opposite. So this, this leads us to ask um, whether a recent population growth, for example, lay, led to a greater role of rare alleles in, in a disease risk or other quantitative traits. Or conversely, did the out of Africa bottlenecks it lead uh, to uh, common alleles contributing much more in non-Africans compared to Africans. Okay, um, and the first step in in, uh, in addressing this is to note that the answer to this question usually depends on the selection acting on the variants that you're considering. <laughs> so, uh, um, what we, so what we could do is we could. Um, uh, you know, uh, we, we could look at uh, different selection coefficients. In this case, we took a certain weak selection coefficient and a strong one, and we could uh, run things through the demographic uh, model and get a distribution of, uh, of uh, allele frequencies. And then we could calculate under the, the simplifying assumption of, a, of an additive model in both uh, fitness and effect size, we could calculate the contribution of different frequencies um, to the variance in the trait. Um, so here you see the contribution of, a, of a alleles below a certain minor allele frequency to the variance in the trait with, with two selection coefficients. Um, and if we begin by looking at the uh, strong selection case, and let's begin by looking at the constant population size case, then, uh, then in that case, in, this is the, the line for the constant population size case, then what we see is that with strong selection, then uh, practically all the contribution to variance comes from rare alleles, in this case below a frequency of 1.5%. And um, OK, and, and that's pretty clear because they're strongly selected, so they don't get uh, to very high uh, frequencies. And now when we look at the uh, lines for African and European, including the uh, recent growth, then we see that uh, the variance is contributed by alleles uh, with a much lower allele uh, frequency. And the reason for that is that the, these same strongly selected alleles, because their turnover is so fast, a lot of them arose after the onset of growth. And therefore, um, uh, you have more segregating sites, but segregating at lower frequencies. Okay, so therefore, you have this shift towards rares if selection is very strong. However, if you look at the weakly selected uh, case, in this case, most of the variance would be contributed by variants that uh, uh, reach high uh, population frequencies, um, and the onset of growth did nothing effectively to the frequencies of these, uh, of these alleles, and therefore, Comparing the constant population size to the African and European, we don't see any substantial change in the contribution of rare alleles. The one thing we do see here is in the in this green line corresponding to Europeans, as we see the effect of the uh, out of Africa bottlenecks in the model. So, due to the out of Africa bottlenecks, we have uh, 
quite a substantially larger contribution due to common alleles, actually, in this case. Okay? Um, however, and, and you know what, another thing we could do, and I'm just going to go through this quickly, is we could take our a class of probably damaging variants and we could assume our simplified modeling assumptions and throw them all together and see what we would get assuming that they all contribute to some trait. And in this case we also see it's much closer to the weakly selected case. So, so they they, the, there is some amplification of rares but it's, it's relatively quite, quite minor. Um, and uh, however uh, life, so, so demography could have a substantial effect. This effect will depend on very strongly on the selection acting on the variance. However, in reality, uh, for a quantitative trait, we're going to have a mixture of selection coefficients and effect sizes. So how should we think uh, about that? And to think about that, uh, first we could think about two extremes. So you could think about one extreme where the uh, selection coefficient on a variant and the effect size are essentially independent. So how, how, how that would happen? So it just means that our trait has very little effect on fitness, but the specific variant could have pleiotropic fitness effects that just comes from how it affects other phenotypes. Okay, so maybe examples for that are uh, some anthrop anthropomorphic traits uh, like height or maybe late onset di disease or uh, uh, that you know, has little effect on fitness would be an example of this uh, pleiotropic extreme. And then you have the other extreme where actually the trait we're looking at is, uh, the, is, is uh, what mediates the main fitness effect of our variants. So maybe examples closer at least to this extreme would be severe early onset diseases or diseases that have a very severe effect on fertility. So, um, it's very likely that most traits lie somewhere in between, perhaps most traits closer, closer to this end. So just to understand how uh, the difference between the two, um, uh, so how, how, uh, how the contribution of rare and common alleles will change within this range, let's take a very uh, simple uh, toy model. So in, in, in this toy model, I'm assuming that uh, mutations come in two flavors. There's mutations with a very strong effect and mutations with a very weak effect. Um, but then for those with a strong effect, I assume that they have a, a probability one plus p divided by two chance to have a large effect size on the trait we're considering. And uh, otherwise, they're going to have a small effect. And for the uh, weakly selected mutations, I'm going to assume that with probability 1 plus p over 2, they will have actually a small effect on the trait and otherwise a larger effect. So, so the, this is obviously a very simple model, but what you could see looking at this model is if I assume that this p is equal to 0, then what's going to happen is all the strong ones, uh, so if p is equal to 0, then the effect size is going to be half large, half small in both of the cases. So essentially, you'll have no correlation between selection coefficient and effect size. And if p is equal to 1, then you'll have a perfect correlation because the strongly selected mutations will have a large effect and vice versa in the other case. Um, more, more generally, uh, the nice thing about this very simple model is that the marginal distributions of selection coefficients and effect sizes actually do not depend on this p. But the correlation between selection coefficient and effect size is precisely p. So it gives us a way of not changing any of the marginal distributions, but changing how strongly the trait is coupled with fitness. Um, so we could use this model. And, and you know, again, here, you, know, you could simulate it. And you could look at the contribution of rare alleles, in this case, below 0.1% uh, um, to the variance in the trait. Um, where first we'll look at the constant population size and then at the African and uh, European cases. And uh, what you see when you look at the constant population size is that when the trait is, uh, when, when the, when the trait is, is not coupled with fitness, then essentially most of our variants in the trait will come from weakly selected things that reach very high population frequencies and just happen to have a large effect size on our trait. Okay, that's where the variance is going to come for, from. And therefore, rare alleles and the strongly selected ones, which are 
a subset of the rares will have a very, li very little contribution to variance in, in, uh, in our trait. On the other end, where um, most of the variance is going to come from a, most of the variance is going to come from alleles that have a large effect on our trait. In this case, they are strongly selected, and they will therefore be rare. And therefore, in the strongly selected case, we have a much larger, a substantial contribution from uh, from rare alleles. Now let's think what happens through the non-equilibrium demographic scenario. So, so if, if we have a recent growth, then um, obviously it's going to affect our strongly selected alleles in, in throughout the range in the same way. But the contribution to variance is only going to be affected where our strongly, where, where our strongly selected alleles contributed substantially to the variance to begin with. So what growth does, it just amplifies the contribution of strongly selected and rare alleles in, in the case that the trait is strongly coupled with fitness. Now, I'll just note in, in closing that a, a very similar argument suggests that a, a, if you a, consider cases where, uh, for a trait that's more weakly coupled with fitness, then in the out of Africa, bottlenecks would have a, would have a large effect generating, you know, increasing the contribution of common alleles in non-Africans compared to Africans by a very similar argument. So to sum up, um, um, our results suggest that the uh, out of Africa uh, bottleneck and, uh, and recent population growth had little uh, effect on the genetic load and our data analysis uh, seems to be supportive of this notion. Um, as for the architecture of complex disease and other quantitative traits, then it seems that, uh, by and large, there's reason to believe that most traits are closer to the are, are loosely coupled with fitness and closer to that end. In that case, we, we actually uh, expect uh, strongly selected sites and uh, strongly selected variants and rare variants to contribute little, and therefore growth would have a little amplifying effect. A possible exception are traits that are strongly coupled with fitness. Um, and I didn't have time to show you, but it's exactly by the same arguments. The out of Africa bottleneck would have a kind of like the double opposite effect. It says that for traits that are loosely coupled with fitness will have a larger contribution of common alleles in non-Africans compared to Africans. Um, so to sum up, I, I'll, I'll uh, use the, the, the version where there's pictures in, in, at the end and, uh, and uh, they say that it was a pleasure. This work was a collaboration between uh, Jonathan Pritchard's lab, now at Stanford, formerly in Chicago, and, and, and uh, my lab. And uh, Michael Torchin, who's sitting right over there, did the, uh, the uh, heavy lifting with the data analysis. And Yuval Simmons from my lab did uh, the bulk of the simulation that, and uh, some of the theory on this. And uh, I should also thank uh, David Reich and Shamil Sunayev for many useful conversations about this uh, bias in the site classifications and other issues during this work. So thank you. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear some of your questions. I'll move closer over here. So, so instead of comparing these uh, derived value frequencies within each of these categories, shouldn't you rather compare the different proportions of these categories in the different populations? So basically, do we have more damaging mutations in Europeans or in Africa? Um, well, I think. Uh, 
or I should double check this. I think this would actually give a. I, I, it's unclear to me. I, I think they should, you know, both go the same way. It's un, so our, th our thought be, be behind uh, comparing it this way is just this is equivalent to just uh, counting up how many uh, derived alleles, which is a proxy for the number of deleterious alleles uh, in an in individual in a given population. And, and you want that, according to our results, this should be uh, very similar in each class. But, but I think that if we, if we do what, what you're suggesting, given that they're the same across classes, that we're going to get the same answer. Yeah, yeah, I, I can't be, you know, because of the statistics, I can't be 100% sure, but I would be surprised if. So I'd say two things. One is um, um, one is that uh, we were focusing on a, on a, you know these European uh, versus African uh, parameters, and you could imagine in uh, founder populations that had m a much more severe bottleneck that you may get slightly different results. I don't think that's the case in the paper you're talking about. Uh, I, I, I think that. You know, among other, among, among other things in that paper, I, I think, for example, they don't account for, so when we did this data analysis, what, what, uh, what happened in, uh, in parallel, it happened in, the, in David Reich and Shamil Sunayev's groups, is that when, when you just do this using the standard classification methods, then you actually do get a difference. But then you notice that uh, practically all of the, the you know, benchmark classification of variance methods use the, use the human reference. Uh, you know, most of the signal for, for the variance comes from uh, phylogenetic conservations, but they include the, the human reference inside. And that generates a huge, a huge uh, bias because um, if the, if the uh, human reference just happens to be ancestral or derived at a particular position, it usually changes the conservation score. So this is something we had to deal with, and, and you know, I think that could be a contributing factor. So I'd say I'm, I'm not, I, I, w I wouldn't go so far, you know, we didn't look at that in enough detail to say that you know, in strongly bottlenecked uh, populations you won't have some short-term difference in load, say, due to very strongly deleterious recessive alleles, for example. So, that, so that's one thing. But I also think that, you know, it's a bit tricky to do the... So they, they didn't the I, 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 should, I should also note in this, in this uh, context, and maybe that's what Nick wants to say, is that, is that uh, in, in, uh, David and Shamil actually looked at many more populations. And they also see, you know, practically no difference across many more populations and saw similar results. I just yeah. want to add a comment. A guy here just mentioned there was a parallel project at David Wright's lab and he's left to catch a plane, which I was not in fact involved with. So I was kind of a spectator of this project. And uh, we get uh, very parallel results, uh, but with one mystery. And uh, the mystery is the Denisova, uh, which appears to have quite similar demographic history to the Altai Neanderthal. Our Neanderthal sample shows no increase in, uh, in uh, deleterious mutations compared with modern humans, but the Denisova does seem to. So this is a puzzle. Maybe there's some data problem, but the data seems very clean. And uh, that's really, um, that's really a, a bit of an unsolved conundrum for us. Well, well, just to say, not, I don't have a specific opinion about the Denisovans, but, but there, there's no doubt that if you wait long enough and you have a demographic yeah. difference between two populations, you will get the difference due to weakly selected. Yeah. Unlike 5,000 years of growth, we're talking like 300,000 years of yeah, so I'm saying that's one possibility. Um, um, yeah. So, uh, sitting here listening, I was thinking, it seems to me like with the bottleneck and with the, maybe with growth also, um, the age distribution of reproduction might change quite radically. And since we already saw very big differences uh, associated with the mutation rate, I'm just wondering whether you examine to see that 
these kind of effects in the same kind of scenario when you consider the age distribution of reproduction, how that is, would that be detectable here and not? So, um, yeah, so, so one, one thing I'd say that to a certain extent we have a control in the synonymous case here, right? Because to the extent that these synonymous differences are neutral, then you know, we're just measuring the number of mutations that happened along a lineage leading to one population compared to another. So, uh, so um, I, I, I think that... if you had a 10-year difference, say, for some period of time in the average age of reproduction, would it be detectable? Should it be detectable? Yeah, so, 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 so I think that... Uh, um, the answer, as, as far as I can tell, because we did some simulations along the lines and some simulations also when we changed the distribution of selection coefficients in each population. And, and, and the answer is that uh, you would have to have, uh, so I'd say you'd have to have quite an extreme effect in order, and this is the important part, in order to have any substantial difference in the number of deleterious alleles carried by individuals in the presence. So I'm, I'm saying it, it could be, uh, not be detectable just because for this to actually have an effect on load, you would have to have a huge effect. So it's not necessarily a problem with our statistics so much as that it's not very easy because most of the genetic variation, uh, in, at least in some of these classes, comes for things that are just much older. So, so uh, and, you know, differences along the lineage could contribute only so much, depending on the time since the split. So, I hope that's a partial answer. I, I think we better cut it off there, so let's, let, let's thank Kai again.